Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Good morning in Singapore to Simon Ree. Hello, Simon. Good morning, Larry. Yes, that's uh, uh, quite a long, this might be my longest distance uh, uh, interview here, especially recently. And uh, I'm in Aspen and you're in Singapore and we're going to talk about winning. And so you've had a lot of experiences in your life, a lot of things, but let's go and say, how did you wind up? at a pretty young age, as in 2006, uh, I have here as uh, the executive director at Goldman Sachs, and must have done well in that position, stayed there from 96 to 2010. And so was that in New York or was that in Singapore? Was Where was that? That, that? That was in Australia. That was in Sydney, actually. Okay, and how did you wind up? How old were you at that time? So I, I guess I, I, I was 20, 27, I think, when I joined, and uh, I must have been in my late th- thirty nine when I when I left. And so, executive director at Goldman Sachs, talk about how you wound up in that position, and what what kind of motivations did you have about your life and things that interested you. Uh, that that's a pretty unique position. So it all started, well, I mean, the, the, it started in high school. Um, my second last year of high school was 1987, which was the year of the, the great stock market crash. And I, I was studying economics as one of my, my high school units. And I found the whole thing fascinating. I, I, I was sort of transfixed by the whole stock market crash, the, the news that was coming from it. And I, I just kind of got a little bit addicted. I, I didn't have any money in the market at the time. I was too young, but I just found the whole thing fascinating. And I, I, I thought, you know, one day I want to be working in the stock market. I, I, this is just too interesting for me. And so that, that, was, that was where the, the seed was planted in my, my second last year of high school. Um, and then I was, you know, finished high school. I I'd, I'd got a couple of off, offers to study, you know, finance or economics or commerce at university. And uh, I spoke to one of my mentors. I, I didn't know whether to study economics or whether to study commerce. And uh, he said to me, look, they, uh, they don't give out uh, PhDs in commerce. They don't give out Nobel Prizes in commerce. You should study economics. It's, a, it's more of a, a real discipline. So I, I did that. Um, but I, I found I was probably more fascinated by the, the finance units more so than the economics units. So I did a combination of economics and finance. And then started working in the banking industry. And uh, my, my first job out of university was working as a credit analyst. Well, actually working as a futures broker. I did that for about uh, six to nine months. Um, this was in 1991, which was uh, bottom of a, a recession, a fairly deep global recession at the time. And, you know, it was, it was a tough way, to, tough way to earn a living. So I managed to get a job uh, as a corporate credit analyst at one of the major banks in Australia. Did that for three and a half years, learned how to you know, pull apart a balance sheet and, and that sort of thing. But I still wanted to be involved in the stock market. So uh, I kept, uh, kept knocking on the doors and eventually uh, uh, Goldman Sachs opened their door to me and I, I got a foot in the door and, and made full use of it. And um, could, couldn't, couldn't have been happier at the time. But uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't completely straightforward because uh, <laughs> my other dream was to be a uh, a lead guitarist in a rock band. And I, yeah. I was a pr- pretty good guitar player at the time. And I was also, you know, I was playing in, a, in an up-and-coming local band and we were doing pretty well. We recorded a, a CD and, a, a, and an EP. And there was pressure on me from my bandmates to, to kind of take that to the next level as well. And it, it got to the stage where I was, I guess I was 31, 32 years old. Felt old at the time. And I just didn't have the energy to pursue both. And I, and I had to make a choice. Well, do I, do I take the safe option and, and pursue the career in finance 
or do I take the risky option and uh, <laughs> try and become a rock star? And uh, of course, I, I took the safe option. Um, sanity prevailed, as did advice from parents and mentors and that sort of thing. I'm and, sure uh, your yeah. <laughs> parents really uh, breathed a sigh of relief. And so, yeah. is uh, what kind of reputation does Goldman Sachs have in? Australia was that a big firm? Was that a prestigious yeah. firm? Did that uh, was that important to get with uh, a company like that rather than just to get in the industry? Look, I, I was with them sort of prior, or well, certainly prior to the global financial crisis. They they were really the employer of choice. They were seen as um, really the one of the best houses you could you could work for or be associated with at, at that time. They were. Winning a lot of business, and they had a had a very good reputation. And you were executive director with Goldman Sachs during two major worldwide recessions. Talk about that. Are the are what's the pressure like being in that situation? Uh, I mean, the tech wreck was that was obviously two thousand to two thousand and two. I mean, the, yeah, I mean the, the Nasdaq got beaten up and and. Markets were volatile, and, and it wasn't a major recession. It was more, you know, the actual economic impact of that was was relatively mild. Um, it was more the stock market impact, and 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 that was kind of exciting, and and it had scary moments. But um, it wasn't. We weren't going through a period where there were there were massive layoffs, and, and where there was genuine fear about the future of the finance industry, the, the you know the banking banking industry. Um, 2008 2009 was was quite different in that regard that was a that was a proper recession um, people were genuinely concerned about the banking banking sector you know how many banks would survive we, we'd already seen Bear Stearns and Lehman effectively go to the wall um, it looked like AIG was next and if AIG hadn't gotten bailed out uh, you know Goldman Sachs was possibly next um, so that was a scary time uh, job losses were horrendous right across the industry i mean being employed in 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 a bank during that time it was a case of uh every day you'd be sitting at your desk and someone next to you or someone a couple of desks over would receive a phone call and then they'd you know they'd burst into tears or security would uh, arrive at their desk with a big cardboard box and and you know the people were just getting cut uh left right and center it was a, a really really brutal environment uh working 14, 16 hour days, you know, back to back. Uh, yeah, it was it was a very stressful environment. And then you're left with their empty desk to remind you. <laughs> yeah, that they're not and there then, anymore. Uh, and then what was great was the uh, the senior managers were, uh, you know, we, we came into early 2009, and and you know they, they were joking about it. Oh, oh, ha ha ha! Looks like we let too many people go, but we're going to have to rehire now. Uh, you know, just just numbers on a spreadsheet. I didn't realize it destroying people's lives in the process. Yeah. Was uh, reaching that point in your life, the pressures of the market going down, how much does that increase the pressure uh, on you in your role? Because, you know, past a certain point, uh, you're limited in how you can respond. Now, if the company runs out of money, they keep the most valuable people. How did you make your? How did? How do you work in that environment to keep your make yourself as valuable as possible and not uh, get knocked out? And also, you know, do your job as executive director. It seems like the spotlight would be clearly on you uh, to deliver things in spite of the market. I think you've just got to. Make yourself indispensable. I, I had a I had a niche. I was the I was the head of a team. Uh, we we were an important team at the markets desk, and uh, we we kind of we knew what was going on better than most other people in terms of what was happening in in derivative markets in in real life and how that was impacting our risk. So um, yeah, I, I I guess that the thing is have, have your niche, have your area of expertise, uh, and and exploit it, make yourself indispensable. How did you learn, I've got to make myself indispensable? When did that dawn on you? Oh, look, I, I think, I think in, a, in, a, in an environment like Goldman, you, you're always, it, it's, it's very competitive, all right? And, and they, they do not suffer fools. Like they are an employer of choice. And there's always uh, people smarter than you, younger than you, brighter than you, hungrier than you, more ambitious than you, trying to 
you know, trying to get in or, or trying to take your job. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I sort of found that I was always just always had a little bit of paranoia, always looking over my shoulder a little bit. I, I, I found it was almost part of the culture. Now, uh, as you, what, what were the worst time of, that you went through there? I mean, the, the worst time is is seeing seeing clients lose money. Um, that's n- nobody likes to see that. And and in an event like two thousand and eight, it's it's almost unavoidable. Uh, it, it was a, an event that really swamped the entire global financial system for for months and months on end. And you know, I, I remember thinking, well, we all thought. Back when when Bear Stearns failed, that perhaps perhaps that was it. Perhaps that was the, the worst was over, and the market actually put in a, a pretty decent rally in the, in the couple of months past that. We all kind of he- heaved a huge sigh of relief, but then there was further deterioration in the credit markets, and then of course Lehman failed in September of two thousand and eight, and then between September and December two thousand and eight, it, it felt like the market fell every single day. It, it was just harrowing. It was incredibly stressful. Uh, it was incredibly upsetting watching clients lose money. And I mean, I, I lost a life changing sum of money myself that year because uh, I, I drunk the Wall Street Kool Aid big time. I, I'd been listening to the guys who I thought were the, the smartest, brightest guys in the room, the Goldman Sachs analysts. And I'd been buying the dip all the way down and I'd, I'd lost a ton of money myself. Now, when you're going through a crisis like that, as executive director, you got a team, right? How many people were on your team? Eight. And they're looking to you uh, for uh, support, leadership. You can't, you know, you can't show weakness or fear or whatever. They're gonna, they're gonna pull a lot of their confidence from you as a leader. How much did you learn about staying strong in uh, the face of? Uh, Defeat, basically, you know, things not going well from the uh, your music career, you know, because yeah. you're not always every venue you play, every gig is not, you know, a standing ovation at the end, you know. <laughs> so it's very true. Uh, how did you? Uh, uh, how did you develop, and what kind of lessons did you carry over from that? That maybe, you know, was part of your core that gave you a toughness. When you're playing in a band, you've got four, four or five musicians on stage. You've all got your own important roles that you must deliver. All right, that nobody is subservient to anyone else. Everybody is very responsible for the role that they fill, and and those roles are kind of pre-agreed uh, in the rehearsal room before you get on stage. What I used to do with my team is literally get get them to tell me what they were going to do. I, I would get them to pretty much take a high degree of ownership in their, their business plan and their strategy. And, and I would, I'd give them guidance in it, but I, I wouldn't give them a list of instructions. I would, I would ask them to tell me what they were going to deliver for me and for the team, which gave them a, a huge amount of buy-in and ownership of it. And, and I think if somebody, if somebody's setting a goal for themselves that you agree with, um, they're far more willing to reach that goal than if you tell them to do something. You hand them a goal and tell them to go and do it. Um, and so I had a team, uh, and, and you know, we, I, w- I was very, very fortunate to have some incredibly bright, energetic people in my team. And uh, it, was, it was humbling to me to, to watch them literally run through brick walls for me. Um, the things that we achieved, uh, the obstacles that we overcame, and, and the, the amount of hard work and drive uh, that they showed was was just absolutely humbling. I, I, I felt almost unworthy of them. Now, what kind of project would they have that just, and what kind of things would they do that really amazed you? You know, showed initiative and drive and whatever. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how much of the global financial system back then, it probably hasn't changed a lot today, uh, is, is held together by Excel spreadsheets. Um, so we had a, a, an Excel spreadsheet that we used as, as part of our risk monitoring. Well, it, was how, it wasn't how we, it was how we monitored risk, but it was more how we summarized risk to senior management. And for example, I, I wanted the spreadsheet to do certain things that it wasn't doing. 
and uh, I had a uh, a young member of the team. Uh, her name was Yvette, and she just said, "Oh, look, I, I think we can build something like that using uh, VBA." I said, "Oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's great. I don't know VBA." She goes, "Neither do I, but I'll teach myself and I'll build it for you." And she went away, and two weeks later, not only had she learnt VBA, but she had built this amazing kick-ass spreadsheet that did everything I wanted and more. And it was just very minimal guidance. I just kind of said to her, I wish we had a spreadsheet that did this. Uh, And she came back two weeks later with, with something really wonderful. It blew me away. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealanwinning.com. Thanks for listening.